silence descends. Excellent. Uh, thanks for coming along, everyone. Oh, quite loud there. I think we're a bit better. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you've got some great choices here, and this is the end of the day, too. So I'm sure if anything like me, your brain is almost at maximum capacity. Therefore, we've got 120 slides of rapid fire good. <laughs> no, we're going to um, do as best we can to sort of paint the, the landscape of testing Java microservices. That's our prime goal today. Make it uh, as sort of fun, as entertaining as possible, uh, given that it is late in the day as well. So uh, we'll introduce ourselves in just a second, but I, we always like to prime kind of yourselves to let you know what we're going to be talking about let you know what the kind of key takeaways are really today. And it sounds kind of obvious, but we find in our consulting work it's not, that testing microservices brings additional challenges. Yeah, microservices, nothing new really, it's primarily around modularization of code. And we've had that from like the 1970s. David Parnas, famous, famous paper, talked about encapsulation, information hiding, modularization. We've been doing this stuff in the monoliths for many years. But for some reason, having like a hard network boundary around functionality, sort of you know, encapsulating our, our services with a hard network boundary, it makes testing much harder. We're going to pitch to you that paying special attention to integration services is really important. We know, I'm sure many of us in the room are Java developers. We know the interfaces are super important for polymorphism, for a bunch of other good reasons around coupling in particular, but this is where we're going to say to focus on in the bigger picture too. We also say isolating services for loosely coupled tests has a lot of advantages, and I'll run through a couple of techniques I've used there with various companies. Abraham's going to go into more detail about including tests that resemble production around data. We've had a lot of fun with various data things. And I'm going to find sort of the final bit of the talk, I'm going to pitch that security is really, really important. I'm sure many of you have seen like from our friends across the pond, uh, like Equifax and a bunch of other companies, like they're the ones that have got caught. I'm sure there's many other organizations that have got security challenges, but we as engineers, we are at the front lines of these, these things. And kind of, you know, Ignorance is no defense now. We are starting to see legal cases coming in, so being aware of security, uh, how to test security, is a really valuable skill, I believe. So this is me uh, at Daniel Bryant UK on the Twitters. I work at a company called DataWire. If you're in the Kubernetes space and using Telepresence or Ambassador, that's where I work at the moment. Uh, I've done a bunch of things over the years, from academic to um, lots of Java, and now I like to say I'm a conference tourist. If there's a good conference in town, you can often find me there at my colleague, my partner in arms here, Abraham. Hello, Abraham. Oh, hello, Abraham, no. Hello, everyone, I'm Abraham. <laughs> that was a good start. <laughs> I can remember my name, that's good. Hopefully, I remember the talk. So, um, similar to Daniel's case, I'm an independent uh, Java and Scala developer, although I do do most of my work with uh, Equal Expert, which is a uh, consultancy mostly based in London, but now expanding uh, into other places. They like to talk, um, or they like to describe themselves as doing digital transformation, which is basically trying to help change the culture and the operation of the organization through technology. It's something that I find very interesting and very helpful, and that's why I like working with them. I also like to describe myself as a software plumber, because at the end of the day, what you do is you just connect things to things and hoping that nothing bad leaks out and everything <laughs> flows into the right places. Um, Daniel and I... I don't think we've ever worked at the same place. However, we do happen to gravitate in the same circle. So for instance, we're both quite active in the London Java community. We both try to help run things uh, whenever we can. For instance, the open conference that happens once a year. We always mm. try to you know, help run it a little bit, help organizing, etc. And also, we both collaborate into InfoQ, although I have to say that our level of collaboration is quite different. Daniel does <laughs> a lot more than I do, but I am happy to put my name into it too. And then finally, the last uh, thing that connects us is this book that we recently uh, wrote together. It's called uh, Continuous Delivery in Java, as you can see. It was published last uh, November. Um, it's available out there at the O'Reilly booth, and well, we'll tell you something about that later. <laughs> the content of the talk today is actually going to be quite related with some of the content of the book, so if you're wondering whether this is something good for you or not, then hopefully the talk should uh, clear your doubts. Anyway, going into it, we're going to be talking about testing. Now, there's a lot of uh, 
There are many types of tests, right? So before we dive into it, we should have uh, a clear idea of what we're going to be talking about. Whenever you talk about the different types of tests, I believe it's very useful to use the ideal quadrants by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. So basically, the idea is all your different types of testing, all your different strategies, can be divided according to two main axes. Right? On one side, we have the horizontal axis, in which uh, what we differentiate is what is the objective of this test. Right? On the left-hand side, we have the tests that are there to support the team. Those are the tests that are there to help you get confidence in the product, to help you make sure that you're doing the right thing. And then on the right-hand side, we have the tests that are there to critique the product, right? That's when you're trying to poke holes in it. That's a typical moment when the developer says, yeah, I'm done. And then the tester comes and says, yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> now, on the vertical axis, we can differentiate tests depending on what they're facing, right? So on the bottom, we have the technology-facing tests. So those are typically the tests that are uh, testing the implementation, testing the connectivity, testing the protocols you know, all those things that we tech people like to do. But then on the top, we have the business-facing tests, which are the ones that are very fine, that whatever you're doing is actually helping the business somehow, it's actually delivering value. When you combine these different ways of categorizing tests, and you have a whole lot of different tests, but that's going to help you identify the tools and the approach that you're using each of those uh, different types of tests. Now, it has to be said, this is not... Um, particular, this is not specific to microservices, right? If you have a monolith, you're facing all these different types of tests too. You have these categorizations as well. But when you're working with microservices, this will bring you additional challenges that you have to keep in mind and you have to resolve. So for instance, the first one is, you cannot have a single test environment, okay? You need to be able to test locally. With a monolith, you might be able to get away with saying, uh, you know what, whenever we do testing, this is what we put our changes to. This is what we install the application, and we all do our testing here. In a microservices environment, you're going to have a lot of microservices. Everybody's going to be making changes constantly, and that environment is going to be too dynamic to be your only place of testing. Right? You need to be able to test locally. However, testing locally is not perfect either, because your environment is going to be so big, so different, so diverse, that you probably won't be able to load the entire thing locally. Right? Maybe you're testing, maybe you're um, building your service in Java, but a different team is doing their services in Scala, a different team is doing it in Ruby, a different team is doing it in, God forbid, .NET. What are you going to do? Are you going to install all the runtimes in your machine to be able to run all the services whenever you want to test a change? That's impractical. You need to be able to do things in a different way. And then finally, you have to bear in mind that you don't have control over third parties, right? So then again, if you want to be able to test your changes, you need to be able to isolate yourself from other things. And this is the key operating word, isolation. Right? I don't mean you go out to the mountains with your laptop and a 3G <laughs> connection and you code there. What I mean is you need to be able to isolate things from each other to be able to test things independently of other things. So let's say this is your typical systems. So you have your services, your queues, databases, and then third-party components. What you want to be able to do is define some boundaries and then define a set of tests within each of those boundaries. Right? The main challenge here is making sure that there are no gaps in your picture. Right? You can achieve that in two different ways. For instance, you can achieve that by having uh, concentric circles of boundaries. So this boundary here is surrounded by another bigger boundary here which is, again, surrounded by another bigger boundary here. So then that way you, have, you, you make sure there are no gaps. Or you can chain the boundaries, like here. So you have one boundary, and then chain, you have another boundary that then overlaps a little bit, but they cover different areas. This is important because if you have a gap in your boundaries, that means an area that you are not testing. And if you have an area that you're not testing, that is a bad way to happen in production. Okay? So first things first, make sure that you don't have gaps. Second, make sure you define your boundaries and you dedicate the, last, the, the right amount of uh, testing effort to each of these. Deciding how to dedicate the right amount of effort, that's a trade-off. It's a bit difficult to decide that, but one thing that can help you is the famous testing pyramid. If you think about it, each of those boundaries is going to align to one of these levels. 
So you can very easily decide how much effort and time you need to put into each oscillation binary by mapping it to one of these levels and say, hang on, um, manual tests, we don't want to dedicate that much to that. We're going to map that to the bigger boundary. And then so on to each of the different levels. So let's begin with the easiest isolation mechanism, which is no, no isolation at all. Right? You just get the whole thing and you test it. Now, this is not a bad idea. There are some advantages to this. One is, well, there are obviously no gaps. You're obviously covering everything. And the other one is this type of testing is the testing that is closest to the actual user experience. Your user doesn't understand anything about components or about queues or about databases. Your user is going to see your application, your system, as a unified thing, and it's going to interact with your system as a unified thing. This kind of test does exactly that. So that's good. However, you might be tempted to say, well, if this is so good, let's just do all the testing at this level. That's not a good idea for a number of reasons. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all those reasons right now. However, Steve Smith has a wonderful article speaking about that called End-to-End -end Testing Considered Harmful. And he does go over all the reasons why trying to test your entire system with no isolation boundaries is actually not such a great idea. So you do do use level of testing, but not just that. OK, so if having no isolation is not good, what is the simplest form of isolation? Just get out the third party components, or what I call, or what we call the unowned components. Now, by unowned, I don't mean nobody owns them. What I mean is you don't own them, or your team doesn't own them. And this is a very important distinction because if anything breaks in this third party module, if you don't own the service, that means you cannot fix it. So then it's very useful to isolate everything that you own against everything that you don't own. Because whenever something breaks within this boundary, you have the ability to change it, you have the ability to fix it. If anything breaks outside the boundary, you don't have that ability, which means these tests inside, you should be able to guarantee that they are always green. Third party can be different things depending on your organization. Some people think third party is anything outside my company. Some people think third party is anything outside my team. I think either option can be OK. The most important thing is whether you have control over it or not. If you don't have control over it, then you need to check it out. However, if you do, then you have another problem, which is this service, it talks to the third party. So if you want to exclude it in your tests, you need to put something there, because this service still needs to talk to something. Now, to be able to put something in place of that third party, then we're going to be talking about test doubles. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. If you can't uh, guess, I'm the one on the left there, <laughs> yeah, um, in my uh, part-time dramatic representations. But I'm sure, like, literally all of us have used test doubles, yeah? It's a fantastic article by Martin Fowler, as many of his articles are, but it talks about mocks versus stubs. And there is a bunch of different types of test doubles, all with different properties, all with different benefits, all with different disadvantages. Yeah. I remember when I first went, um, first discovered Easy Mock, I went mock crazy, mocked everything. Yeah, and it created some very brittle tests because what I'd actually done is I had, you know, the business model, the real world. I had my code model that I'd created, kind of the, the code, and I had the mocked model. All my assumptions I put into Easy Mock. Yeah, and when the world changed or my misunderstanding was, or my sorry, my understanding was wrong, like there was three models at play there the real world, my solution, and my mocks. So be very careful. It's a very powerful tool, but it's a, a sort of sharp sword. And just you know, figuring out what you actually need. Do you just need a, a fake object? Do you just need something, like Abraham said, that you can stand up and that you can poke? Do you want to verify what's going in and what's going out? Maybe like spies and mocks are more appropriate. What I'm going to talk about, I worked with a company uh, called Spectre Labs a few years ago with an, a very interesting open source tool suite around service virtualization. And I learned a bunch. There's some very old school service virtualization tools like Parasoft and uh, IBM and, uh, and um, 
CA, I think we have got a bunch of tools. And they're actually very useful as well, but they were born of the monolith and of the SOA, the kind of classic SOA era, where there's a bunch of new ones, which I'll share in a moment, new kind of more modern, more microservice-friendly virtualization tools that, for me, gave a lot of advantages over some of the other solutions. But all the stuff that Abraham and I are saying today, one of our key takeaways for you is you know your problem better than we do. We're giving you tools for your toolbox, but it's up to you to make the right choice. So we're not saying virtualization is the best thing. We're saying it's a good tool. Yeah. Now, what I often found, like, in, in, uh, this is, and I, I borrowed the slides myself, Andrew. Uh, we did, I think, this talk actually at DevOps a year or two ago. But what we were encompassing, encountering in the company we were working with was we were building a consumer, and there was a bunch of other kind of you know microservices, internal microservices, some external kind of third-party ones, and we wanted to spin up. The, all the dependencies as we were working on the consumer. But they're all Java apps, and as we all, we all know and love Java, but it's like two gig minimum heap for Spring. Yeah? We physically, even though I've got like a nice Mac, we couldn't get all our services stood up. Uh, and we also wanted to test this stuff down the pipeline as well. So what we really wanted to do was bring some of these things in, replace the heavyweight services with lightweight virtual services. Sure, they are virtual, they're not the actual real thing, but we can tune how much real reality we want into them. So we're moving from like the external things we have to spin up, maybe use Docker Compose or you know, some Kubernetes YAML or something. We want to be able to really simply script or maybe like even use JUnit, maybe use a rule or something to spin up these kind of things. There is a bunch of tools in this space. Uh, if you're into Node, Mounty Bank from the ThoughtWorks crew, very nice virtualization tool. I'm sure many of you know and love Wiremock, created by Tom Akehurst, who's based in, in London here. Uh, Tom's an awesome guy to have a, a beer with. There's Karate, a Java-based um, service virtualization. And I recently learned it's also a contract-based testing tool, which I'll cover in a minute, but I only learned that one recently. But Karate is very nice in the Java world. Um, Hoverfly is the one I worked on. It is a Go-based um, system, so very lightweight runtime. But it's got Java, li Java language bindings, .NET language bindings, and Python language bindings as well. So you can spin it up. And if you're more like into the .NET space or more old school, SOAP UI has got some real nice functionality for spinning up these fake services. Heads up, so I've done a couple of consulting gigs where people really got into this kind of virtualizing services. And I'll go into the mechanics more in a minute, but they started wanting to virtualize bits of their platform. They wanted to virtualize Amazon S3. They wanted to virtualize the Azure queue. They wanted to virtualize various bits and bobs that they were, their system was, like Abraham said, it needed the thing to run. So they were using like, these kind of frameworks to fake or virtualize cloud services. But there is tools out there to do this already. If you're on Amazon, AWS local stack is a kind of virtual representation that you can run locally of many of the Amazon platform tools. You can spin up a mini S3, spin up a Dynamo, spin up a Kinesis. It's not quite the real thing. The semantics do differ, but like, it gives me 95% of the use cases. Recently, um, G Cloud have got something called beta, uh, sorry, something called emulators, which is in beta or beta. Um, this, you can basically spin up a fake big table locally. You can spin up a fake big query locally. So my advice is if you start finding yourself virtualizing the platform, first off question, do you really need to have the platform in your tests? I'd say half the time the answer is honestly no. But if you really do need to test like SQS or something like that, then re realize there is other open source tools available rather than trying to create your own version of S3, for example. Anything that's stateful is very hard to virtualize. So data stores, and Abraham's going to break down more about your data store options later on anyway. So it, I, I've as I worked a bunch on Hoverfly. It's fully open source. I'm not making any money of this, so like, excuse the Specto branding, but I've really enjoyed working at Specto. Basically, with Hoverfly, if you're working on a consumer and you've got a producer, you can like, put a thing in the middle, which is Hoverfly, and you can make requests. It's all, uh, at the moment, it's all HTTP-based support, gRPC coming. But um, you can make requests from the consumer against the producer. Maybe you're driving it like the BDD test tool, like Serenity is a great Java-based um, testing tool. Um, you, can drive your, um, you can drive this under test. The consumer then makes a request to the producer, and Hoverfly intercepts and records the traffic. Saves it to a little, either an in-memory data store or an external data store. The idea being then is I can spin up Hoverfly in simulate mode, and I don't need the producer. 
Not only that, I can spin it up locally, but I can put this in the pipeline. This is like a 100K Go binary. It's super small compared to my full fat Java apps. Yeah? And you can inject what's called middleware into Hoverfly to mess with the request and response. So you can do sort of like chaos testing is like super popular term at the moment. But you, we did a whole bunch of fault injection, injecting delays into the data we'd recorded, and returning garbage, seeing what kind of the, what, what our consumer would do with these error cases. Now the data being captured in this data store down here, it's nothing fancy. Yeah, you know you're going to recognize this from a whole bunch of other tools you use. You can see the request in this case HTTP 1.1, and um, you can see the this response we get at the top 200 and an adjacent body. So you can version control this. You can share it amongst your team. There's little um, command lines. You can put like date or UID. You can kind of like have some like generators in there, like a kind of templating language. And it's really quite a nice way. But one uh, big system I had, we could only get access to this legacy system once every couple of weeks. So we used to spin up a bunch of tests, use Hoverfly to record the requests and responses. And for the next two weeks where we couldn't access the system, we could just use a fake version of the system. Now, the key thing is the API and the responses of that legacy system were not changing very much. If you're building a system where the producer is changing a lot, then obviously your tests, your, your data here might get out of sync with the actual thing. So your virtual service, all your tests are green, put it to production, it falls over because the API has changed, the syntax has changed, these kind of things. JUnit example, so you can literally like load in the, um, the, the data, you can see I've got an external JSON file at the top there. I can spin up a Hoverfly in process in my JUnit test and then run my tests and then can it. I can also do Wiremock styles, and Wiremock does this really nicely as well. You can literally kind of almost test drive an API. You can, like before it's even created, you can say, given that I make a call in my system under test with these params, I'll get this data back. Yeah. Quite a nice way to you know, work in tandem with the producer. Like We think the API should be like this, and you can work together, and you can test with this actually running like in a simulated mode, in a virtual mode. So API simulation thoughts. I mentioned that scenario where we had this legacy system we needed to integrate with. We, like, it was very critical to the flow of data up and down the system, and we just couldn't get access to it because it was like time shared amongst the teams. Super useful, re recorded requests and responses. We could test the next two weeks against them. Really useful stuff. Also found that when we were doing like we, so we were um, we couldn't create we couldn't cause the real system to fall over uh, sort of on command. It would fall over, but not on command. Yeah, and it was non-deterministic in its error modes. So we used um, Hoverfly's fault injection to simulate it returning 404. Simulate it returning 503. Simulate it returning garbage. And we could make sure we defensively built our consumer to handle that kind of stuff that happened actually in production. The flip side was that, particularly when you're working with a fast changing system, the simulations, they're quite fragile. Like, I love code, because code is code. It's malleable, it's, you know, it's software, yeah? You can literally change it. Whereas, when you've got massive files of HTTP, you know, of, uh, H, um, uh, Jason, sorry, coming back from the request and response. You can make a mistake and you know, break your tests, or even worse, you can change the data, not break your tests, and then it's not a mirror of what's actually going on in production. So be careful. It's a great tool in some use cases. Yeah? I think it's an undervalued tool. That's why we wanted to present it to you today. Um, but we also want to say be very careful with this thing. Now, one the flip side is in when you're actual interfaces are changing quite a bit in your, in your APIs, or you're building out, say, APIs, then contract-based testing is the way forward. In particular, like, you know, it's literally when you, you've got, say, two, uh, cons uh, two consumers here, and then you've got a producer here. And if you think back to Abraham talked about the test pyramid, it's somewhat fractal, the test pyramid. You know, this is a model of, of testing kind of thing, saying you should do more units than you should probably manual testing. But this was created before microservices were a thing. I can look at this pyramid, we can look at this pyramid, and say, you know, this could be our whole system, or it could really just be one service. If we're building a microservice around business functionality, which I definitely think is the right way forward, by and large, uh, and if you haven't heard of the self-contained system pattern, SCS, thoroughly recommend you look at the SCS pattern by the InnoQ folks. Um, like, you can literally look at individual service as one of these things and test it accordingly, and then you compose the things back together. 
So if you're looking at the overall system view, this is kind of really focused on the system or, or sort of function level. And this stuff up here, and probably some of the automated API testing, to be fair, is more focused on do the things work well together. I can say, you know, given my business functionality of my checkout service, I can test it. Maybe I've got like a GUI built into the service. I, I can totally test that in, in its own isolation. But to Abraham's point, there comes a point where we need to join all these things up to provide the overall system value to the users. Contract tests kind of fit in here. Yeah, so once we've proved individual systems work well, individual components work well, we can use contracts to test syntactically that they work well together. Think Java interfaces, but the compiler checks for you at compile time, whereas here we're testing at build time. Yeah, we're, kind of, we're, we're having our separate network boundaries, we define the contracts between all the different services, and we crank the handle, and it checks they can all talk to each other correctly. Obviously, in Java interfaces, it's part of the language, so it's super easy. Java C, or just hit the compile button in your IDE, and you're good to go. It's a bit different with this. Again, Martin Fowler, like, I do love his stuff, but it's a good reason. It, it's really good, uh, his, his content. Um, it's a bit of a mindset shift. Many of us are used to being given an API, I think, from a producer, and then we just consume it. But often, if you're working with a newish system, the consumers can effectively drive what the producer offers. We can say, I need this data, I need in this team this data, and then you can put them together, and you can run basically tests. So the producer says, Have I, is my API going to work with all of the consumers? And the consumers can also run tests saying, given that I request these things, do I get that from the producer? Now, it, it, I haven't got time to go into it in full detail. This is more of a heads up kind of thing. Check out this blog. There's a bit of synchronizing you need to do in your pipelines to make sure consumers and providers kind of sync up. And, and like whenever a build fails because a contract fails, it's not a blame game. It's a cue for a conversation. Hey, you know, my, my tests are failing. Like, I wanted to change the API. Can we have a chat about how we change the API? It's a cue for a conversation. These things are really important. So one way you can do it, there's a couple of frameworks I'll mention at the end. As a consumer, if you're sort of doing Greenfield, you can literally spin up a virtual kind of representation of your service and build it out using a DSL as you go along. And this is a great blog by Balding there. And this is using Pact, which I'll, I'll mention at the end. But you can see it's very similar to the other kind of affluent DSL I mentioned with, with uh, Hoverfly. It's saying, given that I make a, a, a get request to this path, I'll get 200 with these, um, these, this data back. And you can be clever. It doesn't have to be hard-coded data. You can say, I expect a date. I expect a UID. You can put some functionality in there, like these kind of things. You crank the handle in, in Pact, and it generates this as a contract, which looks very similar, again, to the Hoverfly data, requests, responses. And, and then you can basically version control this, and you can share it amongst the consumers and the providers. The critical thing in step two is once the consumer's defined that test and that contract, they can then give it to the provider to put into their build pipeline. So again, if the provider does some changes and suddenly they're running that, that, the tests that are generated from this contract and it fails, they know that what the, the change they're making is going to break a downstream consumer. And it's a cue for a conversation yet again. So a couple of frameworks. Uh, if you're in the multi-language space, I would totally recommend Pact. I worked on a project where um, there was some uh, Ruby and Java, and we had them running seamlessly. Yeah, we, we had a Ruby monolith. We carved out seams, APIs, in the monolith, and we built Java microservices, and we used Pact to check our APIs were in sync. Yeah. It also has, I think, .NET bindings and some other different bindings. It was very cross-language. It supports AMQP as well. You can do message testing and some Kafka stuff there if you're interested as well. Uh, but Confluent do better tools, I think, for Kafka if you're actually going to do Kafka testing in that space. Uh, if you're in the Spring world, the Spring Cloud contract is a very nice framework. It's not quite as language agnostic, but the developer experience, if you're a Spring person, like I, I certainly was in the past, the UX, the feel of the tool is really nice. So if you're a pure Java shop, pure Spring shop, maybe go with Spring Cloud contract. I found these kind of tools, these, the contract testing tools, are really good in a low trust or low communication environment. And I don't mean to be derogatory when I say that. When you get an organization of a certain scale, clearly communication is hard. Having tools that help you communicate better are good. The flip side, or actually, I'll, I'll jump, yeah, I'll jump to the flip side. The flip side, I found, is they actually can be quite heavyweight. 
maintaining those tests I showed you, running all the contracts. After we got up and running with this Ruby and Java world, we decided not to use Pact at the end. It had given us the scaffolding to get started, and we developed processes amongst the team for, hey, I need to have a conversation. And we had some other tests that caught failures that we actually got rid of Pact because we found it was too much work to maintain. But enterprise organizations I've worked in, I found it super valuable, and we've kept it in. Yeah? So again, it's all you know, about trade-offs. It can be particularly nice if you're um, sort of doing greenfield stuff. You can literally test drive an API using the tooling I showed you. And Marcin from Pivotal, if you Google Marcin, I apologize, I've forgotten his surname, but if you Google Marcin from Pivotal, he's got an example about how to use Spring Cloud Contract to test drive an API. And you can almost give a spec to your team, and then again, it's something to have a conversation around. You've got the spec, it helps the conversation when you're designing an API. They are resource intensive to maintain, you know, it's great to maintain, just to reiterate that point. I've done a bunch of thinking. I've got to shout out my colleague, Andrew Morgan. Uh, we worked together at Open Credo. We did a couple of presentations on this last year, some workshops, and we learned a bunch from, from other people. So I've tried to brain dump all of our thoughts and all the thoughts I learned from you. Um, so you can check out on Medium there if you do want to learn a bit more about those kind of two, two, con uh, two uh, tools. So that note, back to you, Abraham. Components. Components is a dangerous word, right? Everybody understands differences by components. So let me start by explaining what I think of when I say component. Basically, I mean this. I mean a single independently deployable or independently shippable unit, which in the case of microservices is going to be a microservice, right? So again, going with the theme of isolating patterns and isolating one of your microservices is also a very useful thing because if you think of your microservice as a black box and you just test the inputs and outputs of that black box, then that can give you confidence that your service is ready to be put into the ecosystem of all the other microservices that you have, right? So then you want to be able to test at this level. Now, we have similar um, challenges to the ones we talked about before, which is you want to test your service in isolation, but your service doesn't work in isolation. Your service talks to other stuff. It might talk to other services, it might talk to databases, it might talk to queues. So again, whenever we want to isolate a service and test it independently, we need to be, put, we need to be able to put things that substitute those things that we want to isolate from, right? In the first case, if we want to isolate from another service, well, this is very easy, just used Everything that Daniel talked about uh, regarding test doubles, it works here as well. You can just use all that technology, all those tools, just put them there. Databases. Now, databases, if you have the traditional SQL database, this, again, is actually quite simple to do. The good thing about SQL databases, even though they're not as trendy, maybe, um, is that they all work in SQL. And even though they might have slight differences between one and the other, SQL is fairly standard, which means if you work in production with uh, Postgre, you can actually use a different database engine in test, and most of your tests are actually going to be quite reliable. They're going to be quite representative of production. So to that end, what you want to do is use something that looks like SQL, but is very lightweight. The best tool for the job in that case is H2 database. In case you don't know it, this is an in-memory database. So basically what you do is at the beginning of your test, you just load up that, you set it up, and then your service has a database to talk to. But it's going to do everything in memory. When you finish the test, you just shut down that database. Nothing happened here. H2 has been there for a while, and in fact, it has very good integration with some tools. So for instance, if you have, uh, like Daniel said, if you have a, a Spring Boot shop, H2 has such good integration that you don't have to do anything. Spring Boot will just magically detect that you have H2 in the class path and say, huh, you have H2. OK, I'm just going to configure everything for you. You don't need to do everything. Just put it there in the class path. OK, before I move on, um, what if you don't have a SQL database? What if you have uh, NoSQL? What if you have Mongo, something like that? Well, there are some tools, too, that kind of mimic the real thing, but not all of them are as sophisticated as H2 is in the uh, SQL world. So if you ever want to use any of them, feel free to try them, but be careful. Make sure to assert them first. Make sure they actually work the way you think you work, because otherwise you might have some not very pleasant surprises. And then moving to queues. Queues, 
also have the problem that they are not as standard as the other components. So you have many queuing protocols. One of the most popular ones is AMQP. If your queue uses AMQP, then you can probably use either Cupid for the newer versions of AMQP or Active MQ for the older versions. The benefit of using this is that you can run them without persistence, which essentially means in memory. So that again, you have a component that is completely in memory, then you can spin up at the beginning of your test, do all your tests against a queue, and then at the end of the test, just um, get rid of them. What if you don't use any of this? What if you use, uh, for instance, a very other popular option, Kafka? Well, Kafka works on top of Zookeeper, and you can leverage on that because Zookeeper has an in-memory server as well, which means if you have an in-memory Zookeeper and then you have Kafka on top of that, effectively, that gives you in-memory Kafka. So again, you can use your tests, your service, using very lightweight uh, components. Now, how about fault tolerance? We're talking about happy paths. How about unhappy paths? So again, everything that I talked about with Hoverfly, you know, test doubles do it, so you can apply all that content, all that knowledge, all those tools into um, service, into component testing as well. So just configure your test double to fail, and then you can make sure that your component can act the way you want it to act. So for instance, have you got any uh, secret breakers configured? Configure your test double to fail, and then see if your um, secret breakers are actually working or not. Now, testing services in isolation as a black box, that's very nice, but have you ever seen jokes like this? A two unit test, zero integration tests? It happens, right? You have tested your thing in isolation and it works very well, but eventually you actually need to connect it to the real thing to make sure that that connection works, right? Basically, we're talking about isolating the connection itself. We're talking about isolating the interaction itself. So in this case, you don't want to get the boundary covering both the database and the service. You just want to get the boundary connecting the database and the bit of the services that talks to it, right? Here we're testing the technicalities. Here we're testing OK, yeah, that's very fun, but does it actually work with my real component? Does it actually work with my real database? These tests are very useful, but they're usually a bit heavier because that means that you have to bring in the real thing. Right? We talked about, for instance, how uh, SQL is fairly standard and still, you know, sometimes Postgre doesn't act exactly in the same way as MySQL, so you want to make sure that your service is going to behave correctly with all these little quicks of them. Now, fortunately today, that's actually very easy to do because most databases just offer a containerized version of that thing. So do you want to test against a real Postgre? Do you want to test against a real MySQL? We just get a copy of it, spin it up, run your test, and then kill it. Again, a little bit heavier than using an in-memory database, but very easy, very quick to do. If you do decide to do this, you can do it directly, or I can recommend using test containers. Test containers basically is a Java library that wraps the whole thing of getting your Docker image up and down, right? So basically, your test will look like something like this. You say, at the beginning of your test, you say, hey, I want a MySQL container, and test container will get the container for you. And then before each test, you just start MySQL. After each test, you just stop MySQL. And that's it. Everything is contained in your Java. Again, a little bit heavy, but very easy to run, very easy to do. Are there any users of test containers here? Anybody who knows test containers? OK, we have a few. Good. OK, Richard, where's Richard? Oh, there you go. OK. <laughs> so if you like test containers, make sure to say thank you to Richard, who is the, the, the father of the creature. You are the, the creator, Richard. We've got to shout you out and embarrass <laughs> you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, moving on. We've talked a lot about tools, and that's very good, right? We like doing code. We are developers. Talk is where we live. But sometimes it's easy to forget about data, and data can be a very, very thorny thing when you're doing tests. Why? Because your tests, typically, if you do tests the way I usually do tests, then the data that you use in your tests is very different and probably not representative of what you have in production. Usually, the main differences are your test data is low volume and low diversity, while your production data is high volume and high diversity. Right? The problem of volume 
very easy to fix. You can do a script, so then in your database, you can just create a million records before you run the tests, and there, you have volume. The problem of diversity is a bit trickier, because if you do create a million tests, I mean, a million records, you're probably going to do things like user one, user two, user three, user four. That's not diverse at all. That doesn't represent where you are actually going to get in production. And you may think that it doesn't matter, but the thing is, people out there are very creative. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to do things with data that you don't expect, and you don't know how your, your system is going to behave, right? People can do things like, I don't know, maybe trying to type an emoji into their password with very unfortunate consequences. <laughs> Now, unless you actually test out this kind of scenario, you don't know if your system is going to behave. So that's something that you need to bear in mind. But not only that, is because you could say, OK, now that I know about emojis, I'm going to try emojis. How about things that you don't know about? How about things that maybe your keyboard doesn't even have? How about all these things? Like in the past, you could disregard this as, oh, these are special characters. We don't support special characters. But it's 2019, it's a global world. You cannot just disregard this anymore. You need to be able to cope with it, and for that, you need to be able to test it. So how do you make sure that your test data is representative for your production data? Well, the best trick would be just get your production data and put it into your tests. That would be technically ideal, but then there are some considerations to keep in mind, like, for instance, GDPR. Right? You don't want anybody banging on your door and say, hi, can I have 10% of your profit, please? <laughs> So what do you do? You need to get that data, but you need to anonymize it to make sure that everybody's um, rights are protected. If you don't know the OWASP page, please take a look at it as soon as possible. Danny will be talking about it in a bit, uh, in more detail. Within OWASP, there's a lot of useful information. One of them is this page about anonymization. Right? It will tell you the why, it will tell you the how, and it will even point you to some tools that you can use to get properly anonymized, safely to use data in your test. One of those tools called uh, Jailer. So Jailer is a Java tool that you can connect to your database, and you can define some rules of uh, anonymization, etc. And basically, it will extract a copy of that data, scramble it and change it appropriately so as to make sure that it's safe to use, but keeping all the diversity, keeping all the integrity, keeping all the references across tables, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be something that is as complex as what you have in production, because it's kind of a copy of it, but properly anonymized. So it's going to be a very good representation, but still is safe to use. And now the very good thing about Jailer is that when you produce, when you extract this data, it will save it as a DB unit data, um, data set. Anybody uses DB unit or knows DB unit? Yeah, a few people. For those of you who don't, DBUnit is uh, a testing library for Java. So it's, um, as the name indicates, mostly to test databases. But you can also use it to um, set up the database in Java before your test to run your test against that database. So then you can see how we're completing the circle here. Because first, with Jailer, we go to the production database, get a good chunk of high quality but safe to use data. And then with DBUnit, we load that data at the beginning of our test into my good real database. And then I can run all my tests and make sure that my service or my application is working the way it should work. Now, if you do this, you will start to um, get exposed to the real uh, experience, to the real diversity of data that is out there. And then you must start, some, you must start noticing some very curious things, for instance. Just a heads up, Abram, that clock is wrong. We've only got five minutes. Oh. Sorry, I just spotted the oh, clock here is wrong. OK, time to speed up. Thank you. OK, what's the difference between these two? <laughs> OK, maybe that's a tricky question. Who thinks these two are the same? OK, people are scared. That's good. <laughs> they look the same. They are not the same. The one on the left is the common letter A, the one we all know. The one on the right is the Cyrillic I don't even know how to pronounce that mm. letter, but it's a completely different letter, even though they look the same. The Unicode codes are different. If you put this into Java, IntelliJ will actually warn you, this is always false, <laughs> and then you will think that Java is broken. <laughs> now, this, <laughs> this is a great way to troll a colleague. <laughs> 
But the reason I'm, I'm putting this here is not so you, you troll your colleagues, is because this is actually used uh, by hackers these days. This is called a homograph attack, right? They will use characters that look exactly the same, but they're actually different. So for instance, somebody could give you a link to something that looks like um, apple.com, only that A is no, your normal A, it's the Cyrillic A, which means technically that's a completely different address. So you think you're going to apple.com, but you're going to exactly a different place. Right? This data awareness is going to give you a different type of awareness of security. It's going to give you a different type of awareness of things that can happen. And then this way we segue into security, which is the rest of the topics. Yes, this is going to be a whistle-stop tour, because unfortunately our timer was wrong at the front of Sorry. the stage. No worries, Erin, no, my fault as well. Um, so, uh, but the good thing is about this, there's plenty of links to take away, like, like we're trying to do here, give you some sort of thoughts. Um, Love Abraham's suggestion about OWASP. Totally, like, if you have not heard of OWASP, like, that is the number one takeaway from this conference, in my mind. Please do check out the OWASP page. Like, the basic top 10 web attacks, like the attack vectors that people use, we, you should be able to recite this. If you consider yourself a professional software engineer, you should be able to, like, recite this stuff back. Bunch of awesome tools. One of my favorites, in addition to Jailer and a few other ones, is the OWASP Z attack proxy. Like if you go to their site, there's many tools, but this is an automated penetration testing tool. Doesn't replace manual penetra penetration testing, but it's a nice thing to run against your microservices in the pipeline. There is an awesome framework called BDD Security, which wraps the Z attack proxy with a BDD, like given when then, like syntax, which I find it very easy to set up cause testing, SQL injection, bunch of other things. These, you know, definitely number one takeaway from this section, check out the OWASP website. In the book, Abram and I go into a lot more detail. And in particular, we think there's three levels we as Java developers, we as engineers in general, should focus. The first is on the code, the code that we write. And therefore, static code analysis tools like FindBugs are fantastic. There is a security module for find bugs called find sec bugs. And it will look for the weak use of random CLI injection attacks. It only looks at static, you know, kind of comparisons, but it's detected stuff on teams I have worked with, which is a fantastic, super easy to put in your pipeline, high value. With microservice projects, you're often bringing a lot of dependencies in. Spring, Vertex, whatever, a lot of libraries going in. And we, because we're bundling those in our code, we are responsible from a security perspective on those dependencies. Another awesome OWASP tool, it's language neutral, it's a bunch of di different support, but we'll focus on the Java one called the OWASP dependency check. And links there for you. You literally, like I, I'm, I'm a big Maven fan, but Gradle, Gradle's even easier. 10 lines of code, it looks at the dependencies you've got in your POM or your Gradle file. It then bundles those dependencies in the versions, checks against a known directory for vulnerabilities in those versions. So logback 1.2, the known CVE, like it will flag on the build, it will fail the build, saying you're using version 1.2 of logback, it's got a known CVE. You can typically, when I discover these things, you just bump the version number up to the latest version, do some more tests to make sure nothing has changed, um, and you get rid of that security issue. For 10 lines of Maven code, probably two of Gradle, super useful. I, I had a project, actually, uh, we built it, waited three months, and then put it into production. But before we did, we obviously ran it through the pipeline, and we picked up, f just in three months, five CVEs. And I think one of them was quite an open attack vector with XML injection, which would have been very bad for the company. So running these things, super useful. If your management's not fully on board, you can generate reports and show them how scary some of these CVEs are, for example highly valuable. And lastly, most of us, many of us maybe, uh, are packaging our microservices in containers. We've got whole other talks, I've got whole other talks that go into using Java with Docker and so forth, but what I do want to say is you do need to scan the container images. There's the code dependencies, but with a container you bring in operating system dependencies. Things like Heartbleed and Dirty Cow and all these kind of crazy things. You want to be scanning for that. Open source project called Claire quite tricky to use. Hat tip to Armin, when I did this talk a while back, he's, he has created a Docker container with Claire all pre-packaged. So you can use a Docker container to scan a Docker container to scan a, it's like Inception, if you've seen the movie, yeah? <laughs> but it's super useful. I'm not sure how well maintained Claire is, so heads up on that one. I find myself using Aqua's tools. They have a commercial offering, but they have an open source version. You literally, in the open source version, have to add in a few bits and pieces, the binary. 
and run the scan, and it will give you a vulnerability count in the container. Uh, as a heads up, like I did this on, I think it was Java 8. Uh, there was a couple of vulnerabilities, very crazy attack vectors, probably not, not too much of a worry. Still need to know, but not too much of a worry. I pulled um, down, like, I think this was the, what did I, I pulled down an old version of Java. It was only a year old, yeah? I pulled down the year old version of Java. I'd even used the JRE only, and I put an Alpine container, which is meant to be more secure as well. But in that year's difference, the vulnerability count went from like two with one high to 10 vulnerabilities with three critical issues. Yeah? So if you've got a one year old production, uh, one year old version of Java running in production, you could be exposing yourself to these issues, yeah? Really need to be aware of these things. And if you're running in containers, these tools make it easy to scan. So very quickly wrapping things up, and while our time is out, like, I won't go through them again. These are our takeaways we'd like you to walk away from today. We've tried to brain dump some of our mistakes, some of our successes, with the idea being that you can learn from us, and hopefully you can come back next year and do your talk on what you'll kind of have learned around testing microservices. So on that note, I shall say, we shall say, I should say, thank you very much.